Okay, there's two people. The rest, the rest of you are living in conscious denial. And what are you doing, please? I <laughs> Okay. Your mic. Um, is it, can I wear it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, honestly, Limud booked my flight, so why I have this session as soon as I go, that's okay. <laughs> I'm not complaining. You know that we Americans are very easygoing. Yeah. What was that? Are these sessions taped? Good. So nothing I say can be used against me, correct? I'm free. It's not being taped, then let's get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, I had the unique privilege of living in the United Kingdom for 11 years. Six of my nine children were born here. Uh, my eldest son was born here. He is now a Chabad rabbinical student in Frankfurt, Germany, and he flew in this morning from Germany to meet me, and I'm grateful. Hello, Mindy. <laughs> Hello. And he was born in Oxford, England. And it really is a pleasure to be back. Thank you all for coming. The Jewish people don't matter. I know you probably believe that we do, but we don't. We do not have a seat at the table of intellectual ideas. To the extent that we carry any kind of political weight in the countries we live, it has nothing to do with our ideas, our values, our history. It has to do with one thing and one thing only. It's called money. That's right. If Newt Gingrich or Mitt Romney come to the Jewish community, as I witnessed all of the Republican candidates for president coming to the Republican Jewish Coalition meeting two Thursdays ago in Washington, D.C., they don't come to discover how to fix the American family. They're not coming to discover how America can experience a spiritual renaissance or a spiritual resurgence, or weaning off America off of suffocating materialism. They're not coming even to discover how America might fix its economy. And the same thing I would presume is true of politicians in this country. When they come to the Jewish community, they're coming for one reason and one reason only. It's called political contributions. You take away Jewish money, and you have effectively negated Jewish influence almost completely. Because the people of the book have become the people of the buck. It's not true of the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama doesn't have two nickels to rub together. He walks around in a sheet. But they come to him for answers about how to live a more enriching life. They come to him for answers about how to find spiritual purpose. There are people in this world whose wisdom is valued. It's just that the Jews are not on that list. That is how much we have been marginalized in the marketplace of ideas. Part of it is self-ghettoization. We Jews don't believe that we have much to offer the rest of the world. In fact, the last person who thought that Judaism was a universal creed which could actually convert people to its doctrines was a man named Paul of Tarsus, also known as Shaul. In one of my later lectures this week, I'll be speaking about a brand new book that I published called Kosher Jesus, which focuses 
on the decision that Paul made to take the truths of Judaism and offer them to the rest of the world. But he was probably the last Jew, if indeed he was a Jew at all, because that's under historical contention. He was the last person to believe that Judaism had a universal message for all peoples of the world, and he made Christianity, Judaism light, the most successful idea in the history of the world, to which 1.3 billion people currently adhere. But do you know what the ramifications were of that marketing effort? Everything that we Jews contributed to the world today goes by a different name. God's name is Jesus Christ, or Allah. Shabbos is called Sunday. The Ten Commandments are called Morality, ethics. The verse in Genesis that says that every human being is created equally in the image of God is today called democracy. You cannot trace the dots of a single one of these doctrines back to the Jewish people. The net result is no one understands they originated with us. And because we cannot claim an intellectual copyright on any of these ideas, no one sees us as having anything to offer that is substantive. Now, that presented a really big problem for people like me who were campus rabbis. When I was at Oxford for 11 years, and I was trying to get young intellectual Jews who were Rhodes Scholars, Marshall Scholars, Truman Scholars, Fulbright Scholars, to re-embrace their heritage, and I wanted them to convince them that Judaism had something to say to the whole world. That they didn't have to abandon or jettison their Jewish identity in order to contribute to mainstream society. I was fighting an uphill battle. Because their argument was, what are you talking about? What contributions have the Jews made? We know what Aristotle did, we know what Plato did, the Greeks, the Romans, but the Jews, all we did was die. Our history is not glorious, but tragic. It is my purpose, in the five appearances that I have at the Mood, to bring a message of the universality of Jewish values and how Judaism is uniquely equipped among all the religions of the world, all the spiritual systems, all the faith constructs to bring unique healing to the Western world in its gravest moment of crisis. Because make no mistake about it, the Western world is on the decline. It's not on the decline because the institutions of democracy are faltering. They're not. Nothing has replaced a belief in the superiority of the democratic system. No one's convinced by the Taliban or radical Islam that we should be adopting something different. Communism's on the decline. No one believes that we should have some sort of fascist system like in North Korea. It's not democracy which is on the decline. Less so, is it capitalism that's on the decline? Yes, economies around the world here in Britain, the United States, are faltering. But that's seen mostly as mismanaged economics. No one believes for a moment that we should be turning to communism or some other economic system in order to salvage the Western world. Rather, something else happened. The basic values of the Western world are in crisis. And that's what I want to talk about. They are in crisis because the Jewishness behind these values has eroded. Judaism offered the world unique values, which I just said to you were sort of appropriated without attribution, but they were changed in the mix. They were modified, and in the course of that modification, they lost some of their potency. And the net result is they're not as effective. And I want to focus on how we can reconstruct the Western world based on the Jewish input. So we can finally bury Jewish, Jewish self-ghettoization and Jewish insularity forever. My friends, there is no future for Jewish insularity. Judaism that applies only to Jews is dead forever. It can't work. We know that because only 10% of the world Jewish community is interested in that insularity. We have spent, since 1967, when the Lubavitcher Rebbe started Jewish outreach, when he, when he inspired first Chabad and many people who have since followed suit to take what we have here and bring it to secular Jews, how much has been spent on Jewish outreach? 
whether it's the Limud Conference, whether it's opening new synagogues and day schools, whether it's opening mikvahs, whether it's opening Jewish universities, whether it's just programs for Shabbos. How much has been spent since 1967 on Jewish outreach? What would you guess? Hundred billion dollars? A trillion dollars? I mean, we're talking mammoth amounts. The Chabad budget alone annually is two billion dollars a year. I don't you take everything else. You're talking about mammoth, mammoth expenditure. What impact has it had? We love, we love patting our back, ourselves on the back and speaking about how much of an impact we've had. What have we been effective? What was the intermarriage rate in 1967 in the United States? It was 50%. And what is it in the year 2011? 50%. It hasn't changed at all. In 1967, there were 5,000 Jewish students at Harvard. How many went to a Shabbat dinner? 50. You know how many go today? 10 times that number, 500. That's amazing. Isn't that progress? That means only 4,500 don't go. We have barely scratched the surface. And the reason? The model is flawed. You can't keep on spending money telling secular Jews who want a mainstream life to come back to the Jewish community. You need to do the opposite. You need to take what we have and bring it to them. And at that, we are the worst. We suck. There is nothing Jews are worse at than having a media impact. Israel is one of the most righteous countries in the world, and yet it is only second, statistically, in, in, it is second only to North Korea as being the single most loathed nation in the world. I mean, you have to suck at PR <laughs> to have a worse reputation than Afghanistan. And yet, our biblical mandate is to be a light unto the nations. But we have no concept about how to take our ideals and our truths and to share it with the rest of the world. Purpose of today's, that was my preamble. <laughs> now I'll spend the rest of the time just talking to you about my early childhood. <laughs> it's a very interesting story, actually. <laughs> Sit back and relax. That was my preamble. Our purpose in the five lectures that I will deliver here, God willing, is to demonstrate how Jewish values can bring healing to the world, so long as we bring it well beyond our community. Today we will focus on the great crisis of the Western world, the collapse of Western economies, the glut of materialism. And I'll begin with two quick stories. The first is that this past Friday, just this past Friday, I pre-taped a show in the United States. We have three major networks, really four with Fox. One of the major networks is CBS. They do a, early sh uh, a morning show called the CBS Early Show. We, we pre-taped, because we're supposed to be on Shabbos, they accommodated me. Me and Father Edward Beck, a well-known priest, and, and an imam pre-taped the annual show that every network does, the true meeting of the holidays. And this is supposed to be one of these incredibly boring religious segments where they sort of uh, pay lip service to the need to talk about the true meaning. So amidst everybody running out to buy a Tickle Me Elmo, amidst riots in the department stores, we had people beating each other up. We had riots in department stores over last minute shopping. Amidst all that commercialization, there's always a, a truer, deeper meaning. I decided to talk on that show about why the heart has, be, has been replaced with objects. Meaning, do you know what the number one remedy is in America for depression? One out of three American women is on an antidepressant. And you'll have to forgive me for using American statistics throughout because I'm no longer very conversant or familiar with British statistics. But I can't imagine it's radically different. Today, the Western world is quite uniform. One out of three American women is on an antidepressant. Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, these are the miracle drugs of a new generation. But even pharmaceutical help is not the one, number one remedy for depression. Anyone know what it is? The number one remedy for depression isn't even shopping. It's a form of shopping. It's a very interesting form of shopping. Shopping is where you decide you need something and you go to the store to buy it. The number one remedy for depression 
is the impulse purchase. It's a very different thing. It's where you go not planning to buy anything because you don't need anything. But you buy this big hunk of garbage because it fills some gaping hole inside you. You feel a void, you feel a cavity. And it, you feel better. There's an object that you buy that you don't need, which brings you a certain degree of happiness. The impulse purchase. This is why eBay is so popular. Because eBay is where you sell on Friday all the garbage you bought on Monday. <laughs> now, of course, you sell it for just pennies on the dollar. But what is eBay? eBay is where you unload junk. It's so bad, our dependency on objects to bring us fulfillment and happiness, that I, one of the great honors of my life was when Oprah Winfrey gave me a daily radio show on her Oprah and Friends Radio Network, where she chose seven seminal subjects which she thought were vital to the culture. And most of them were predictable. Dr. Mehmet Oz did medicine and health and weight and diets. Gail King did the culture, celebrity, news. Oprah did spirituality. Other people you may not have heard of, if I said their names, did finance. And then suddenly she had a seven hoarding. How to declutter your home from hoarding. And we were all like looking at each other when this was chosen. Really? Is that one of the seven areas of life? Like how to get rid of all the junk that's cluttering your life? But that was the most popular show of all. Because in a world where I have, therefore I am, in a world where we have corrupted Descartes' maxim of I, I think, therefore I am, in a world where our possessions define us, you can't even throw out your old garbage because it's like cutting off a finger. And it doesn't matter how old it is. Part of you is defined by this old coat that you never wear. And your, your, and your closets are bursting. And you actually need someone to come in and give you therapy to detach yourself from all these objects and possessions that give your, that prop you up, that give your life a degree of meaning. Fascinating. Objects give us identity. This can be abused in many ways. The man who decides that the best way to go on a date with a woman is to buy the most expensive car. He accessorizes. It's not his actions which will win him over, win her over. It's rather the material possessions he comes with. And we all know this is kind of true. Because every time, in the same way that men have their superficial tendencies in relationships, like whenever a guy comes to me and says, well, you know, I'm 30, it's time, I've dated so many women. If I wake up next to another stranger, I'll, I'll, I'll lose all my self-respect. I really need intimacy, I need a soulmate. Introduce me to someone, and I'll say to him, I have the nicest woman for you. She is spiritual and intellectual, and she's service-oriented, highly educated, and he's asleep by the time I've said all that. <laughs> And then he asks the one question that every guy ever always asks. He says, what does she look like? Of course. And when I tell them, oh. Well, her hunchback will give you great, really good piggyback rides. <laughs> and when I had dinner with her last week, I didn't even notice when the glass eye fell out into the soup. <laughs> Suddenly, you know, Shmuley, I'm really interested, but I forgot to tell you, I'm gay. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I should have mentioned that from the outset. I'm gay, I, I apologize, got any nice guys. But the woman is the opposite. She will have to meet someone. I'm 30, I really want to have children. You know any nice guys? Oh, do I have a guy for you? He writes poetry whenever he sees a sunset. <laughs> he visits his mother every morning. Kiss of death, by the way, absolute <laughs> kiss. Of death. She's already rolling her eyes in contempt. He reads books 
and he's spiritual, and he has thick glasses, and his name is Myron. <laughs> and he works as a part-time night watchman in a local junkyard. I'd love to go out with him, Shmuley, but I, you know, I forgot Tuesday. Tuesday's the only day he's, I'm washing my hair that night, you know. And if it wasn't something urgent, I would definitely go out. Men learn to accessorize in order to impress women, because in a culture where objects give us, lend us identity, the more valuable the objects, the more valuable the person. How did this happen? In other words, this is what I'm saying. My friends, Western society is eroding because we have made money into a currency by which we purchase self-esteem. I want to repeat that. For us, money has become a currency by which we purchase self-esteem. Now here's the problem. If money is a means to an end, and it is the, it is the means by which we obtain the necessities of life, perhaps even luxuries of life, then enough one day is going to be enough. Because you have certain needs, and once they're catered to, or even slightly more than that, you begin to feel burdened when you have too much. But if you are filling a gaping inner hole which can never be closed because this is not about whether you have enough, but it's about putting it into a chasm, a black hole, then enough will never be enough. Because you are now using money competitively in order to establish your self-esteem. And now you're competing against everyone else who also is using money as a currency by which to purchase self-esteem. And it's competitive. It's no longer about how much you have. It's about how much you have in relation to somebody else. There was recently a study that showed men were given the choice. If you could earn 20% more money next year, or your colleagues can lose 40% of their net worth, what would you prefer? What do you think 80% of men chose? They wanted their colleagues to lose 40% because there was a net gain of 20% in that case. This isn't about earning money anymore. It's about filling a gaping hole. Where did this hole come from? How did we become so spiritually bereft that we now need to shove all these objects into this void to lend our lives meaning? Here is where. I focus on Jewish values, the universality of Jewish values. Not Judeo-Christian values, hyphenated values, but uniquely Jewish values. Let's go back to the first story of the entire Bible. There's a man and a woman, naked as the day they were born, frolicking in a garden, where they essentially own nothing. They don't even own the shirts on their back. They don't have any possessions. And yet, they're happy. They're content. Because in each other, they've discovered paradise. They essentially feel that they only have one need. When God creates Adam, he experiences a single emotion. And that emotion is loneliness and God says lo tov hayosa it is not good for man to be alone so the only need that adam has is the assuaging of his loneliness he wants to be necessary to another human being he wants to be vital and essential to somebody else and only when god creates a flawed creature like himself imperfect who needs Adam as much as he needs her. In other words, someone who gets cold at night and needs to be held. Someone who questions herself and needs to be complimented. Someone who is incomplete and needs to be fulfilled. Only when Adam begins to feel essential and Eve begins to feel essential, they find happiness because they only have a single need. What is humankind's greatest need? What is the single most important need that each and every one of us have? To be needed. Oh. As Ava and Joshua Heschel said, no, it's not to be loved. To be needed. I'll prove to you, I'll prove to you very quickly that it's not to be loved. If our greatest need is to be loved, 
then no woman here would ever leave her parents in order to marry. Your parents are always going to love you. They, they're never going to divorce you. Your parents aren't going to cheat on you. When's the last time we heard a story of Mr. and Mrs. Jones going secretly at night to the little Mikey, the next door neighbor's kid? <laughs> Mikey, you're the son we really love. <laughs> you can't tell anyone. We're going to have a secret relationship. Here's a soccer ball for you to play with. But you can't show it to anyone. One day we will adopt you, discard our own son, and we'll be able to celebrate our love unimpeded. It's absurd. If you want to be loved, you never leave your parents, because your parents will love you unconditionally. So why does a woman leave her parents in order to marry? What's she looking for? You know, Sigmund Freud faced this question, and he couldn't answer it. Freud answered almost every question about the human subconscious except one. In 1938, he famously wrote, I cannot answer the question of what it is that a woman wants. In fact, till today, Freud is hated by feminists because he saw women as, as castrated men. Women had penis envy. They wanted the strong masculine qualities. He never understood women. What is it that a woman wants? As a man who's deeply in touch with his feminine self, I can answer it. <laughs> Every poor I dress up in one of my wife's dresses. A woman does not want to be loved. A woman wants to be chosen. Your parents can do everything for you except one thing. But it's the thing you, want, you most want. They can't choose you. When your mother says, you're the prettiest girl in the whole class, and you're the smartest, you roll your eyes and say, sure, mom, whatever. Now, why don't you believe her? Because she has a genetic rifle to her head <laughs> making her say that. But when you're in a class with 50 boys and 50 girls and one of those boys comes over to you and he says, you are the prettiest girl in the whole class, you believe him because he had no compulsion to say it. And that's why women love marriage. Because marriage is the ultimate form of being chosen. <laughs> because it involves deselecting six billion other women. That's what Adam and Eve wanted. They wanted to be chosen by one another in order to establish their uniqueness. You see, if someone chooses you, it means that you're special. The greatest human need is to be unique. And the greatest human fear is that we're ordinary. And we spend our lives trying to prove that we're extraordinary. And Adam and Eve had no possessions, but that was okay. Because the greatest need is not to have a handbag. And the greatest need is not to have a bed. And the greatest need is not to have your own business. The greatest need, we only use those things to prove our uniqueness. Look, I drive this fancy car. I must be special, I must be unique. No, that's not true actually. Because the car can be taken away from you. All uniqueness must come from within. Adam and Eve had, had that. That's the essential story of the Garden of Eden. The man and the woman who have no property are happy <coughs> because they have chosen each other and established each other's uniqueness and neither feels ordinary. Each feels special. But then, it all goes wrong. In the most tragic story ever recorded, the serpent comes along to Eve. Now you can just imagine the scene. One day, Eve is out frolicking She's happy, she's smiling. And the serpent approaches her and he says to her, you look happy? She said, yeah, I'm very happy. And he says to her, you, you look content? Yeah, content. And he says, why are you happy? And she says, because I have everything I need. And he says to her, everything? She says, yes, everything. And then he uses guile and trickery to bring about devastating consequences to humankind that last till this very day. What does he do? He says to her, you're happy because you have everything? And she says, yes, how many times do I have to say this? And he points to one thing she doesn't have. 
the forbidden fruit. And he says, what does that taste like? And her response is, oh, you know what? I don't know. So he responds, but I thought that you had everything. And now she thinks to herself, you know what, he's right. What does it taste like? She doesn't know. And she comes home and for the first time she's not smiling. And now Adam looks at her and says, why so glum? And her response is, you know, what about those vacations that we can't afford? What about those department stores like Harrods that we can't shop in? We go to JCPenney in the United States. Why can't we afford Neiman Marcus? What the serpent has done is simply focus, refocus her attention away from what she has to what she lacks. She's no longer focused on what she possesses. She's focused on what is absent from her life. Now here's what's interesting. What does the serpent represent? He represents insatiability. The inability to ever be satisfied or happy with what you have. That's why he is cursed to eat dust for the rest of his life. Dust is plentiful. It's everywhere. You can find it wherever you seek it. There is only one property it doesn't have. It's never filling. You can eat it and eat it and you're still hungry. Does that not represent a generation suffering from childhood obesity? No matter what our kids eat, they're still hungry. A generation of people who are always struggling with weight gain because no matter what we eat, no matter what we devour, we're still not full because what we're eating and devouring is not filling. That's the tragedy of the story of Adam and Eve. The serpent represents insatiability. Once he digs his fangs into you and injects his poison, what does he do? Do you know what a snake bite feels like? You don't feel hot. You feel cold. He makes you shiver. He makes you cold to all of your blessings, to everything you have. Now it's the husband who has a wife who's taken his last name, had his kids, and her figure is somewhat distorted by having those children. But instead of him loving her more, on the contrary, he now finds flaws. He's now unhappy with what he has. And he develops a roving eye. It's now other women. You know, studies show that 84% of husbands think about other women while making love to their wives. The other 12%, the other 16% lie. <laughs> 84% of husbands make, think about other women making love to them. Think about that for a second. Here you are in the closest physical proximity to a woman that bears your name. She is your wife, with whom you have kids. Closest physical proximity. You think about somebody else. Here you are, making love to your spouse, but in your mind, you're doing a guest appearance on America's Next Top Model. <laughs> More so, studies show that 98% of women close their eyes during sex. That's an incredible thing. 98% of women close their eyes during sex. And when asked why, they say, because if they don't close their eyes, they can't completely enjoy the experience. In other words, only if I tune you out can I really enjoy this experience. So think about that for a second. Whenever you're in an elevator, notice that you look at the numbers. Nine, eight, seven, six. When you're driving a car, you're holding a Starbucks Hoka Mocha Chino for which you sold a kidney just to afford it <laughs> with your right hand. With your left hand, you're smacking the kid behind you, holding a cell phone. You're not even looking at the road, but the moment you're in an elevator, the only goes up and down, you need to look at the numbers. Nine, eight, seven, six. Now why is that? What did you think? It was going to take a left turn? <laughs> you know, I wanted to go to the 10th floor. I ended up in Kansas. I mean, this isn't like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. Why are you looking at the numbers? Because in the close physical proximity in an elevator with another person, the eyes are the windows to the soul. It's too intimate. You don't want a stranger peering so deeply into you. I understand when you're in an elevator. But even when you're making love to your spouse, you need to tune them out, close your eyes in order to invite a world of fantasy. Even in the most intimate moments, we remain insatiable. 
And that's why we make other people constantly feel like they're not good enough to make us happy. In this recession, I am counseling so many men who are questioning their very masculinity because they can't pay their bills, they can't support their families. Husbands who lie to their wives after they're unemployed and go out with a briefcase day after day because they can't admit to their wives that they can't hold a job. Because when Eve comes back and says, to, and is no longer smiling, and Adam can no longer feel good about himself because no matter what he provides for her, She's still not happy. Once human insatiability takes over from human contentment, we're all devastated. But here's a very interesting question. Most famous story of the whole Bible, Adam and Eve. Did any of you ever ask the question, why does the serpent approach Eve? Why her specifically? Isn't it men who are insatiable? Isn't it men who are greedy? Isn't it men who no matter what they have, it's still not enough? The Donald Trumps of this world who have to put their name on every single building they ever buy? Alexander the Great, who's so connected with the story of Hanukkah because he had to conquer the whole world. Julius Caesar, Hannibal, go through all of history. It's men who are insatiable. It's men who want the forbidden fruit. It's men who cheat on their wives. It's men who are involved in every single sexual scandal every single day. Why does the serpent approach the woman? If he wants to inject his poison, this insatiability, into one of the two and be successful, the smart money would have been on the guy. Man already has it. Let me take it further. The serpent is cursed. According to our tradition, he used to walk vertically like a man. And then he's cursed and God says, you will now slither on your belly, representing the quintessential fall of mankind. Once upon a time, everybody needs novelty in life in order to be more exciting. You can't do the same thing over and over again and still find passion and routine. You need to do new things. But once upon a time, people found novelty, newness, excitement vertically by being, by having an erect posture. They reached higher spiritually. They reached deeper emotionally. And in that vertical posture, like how does a, how do a husband and wife sustain romantic attraction for 40 years when you're making love to the same body, having conversations with the same personality? How the heck could it be as exciting? And most people will tell you it can't. I debate evolutionists all over the world. You probably know I've debated Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens just passed away. I just wrote a eulogy to him. He and I had four debates. They will tell you that marriage is a, is a, is a, is a sham. Once upon a time, you've heard the arguments, people popped off at the age of 30. Bubonic plague, every single disease. So marriage has only lasted 10, 15 years at most. And that, that was sustainable. But now that people live to 70 or 80, this is no longer sustainable. That's why marriage is dying in the Western world. Once upon a time, so how do people sustain passion and excitement? Simpler, simple, you do it vertically. Let's say for example, the eroticism begins to die in a marriage. Well, a husband can examine his wife's erotic nature through erotic conversation. He can discover her fantasies through deep erotic conversation. He discovers such deeper dimensions of her personality. They go higher and they go deeper. But the serpent says to Eve, no. He will slither on his belly. The only way you can find excitement is horizontally rather than vertically. It's by traveling constantly. It's by possessing more and more things. It's by buying more and more things. It's by consuming more and more things, which is why till today, the title they give us is consumer. So we've left a vertical posture and we've gone to a horizontal posture. You'll notice that the, the posture of the living is vertical and the posture of the dead it's horizontal, because we've become the living dead by becoming so dependent on dead objects to bring us happiness. But how does the serpent know to go to Eve? How does he know to go to Eve? Help me here. Men are insatiable. Men are the ones who are, evolution says that men seek the widest possible distribution of their gene pool by mating with as many women as possible. Evolution says that men are the ones who are never going to be monogamous. How does he know to go to the woman and not the man? The commandment is given to Adam, 
and who repeats it to Eve. They both know the commandment. And now the serpent wants to entice them with this insatiability. He wants them to focus on what they don't have instead of what they do have. How does he know to go to Eve? Um, I trust that you know what this is, if I'm missing something here. How does, how does trust fit into it? I don't know, possibly the woman... You never trust the guy? He's more inclined to be, um, yeah, untrusting. The woman is more inclined to be untrusting. Because, because she thinks the guy is, is, can't be trusted, is that the reason? <laughs> well, I, th I think the average woman's gonna trust a man until she's been hurt, no? Until she's experienced something negative, or unless you're just unless you're saying that women think that all men are bastards, is that one of the, 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 all, the all men are bastards philosophy? No man can be trusted. Women are more hurt by emotional Okay, very interesting. If you said a man. She would refuse a roving eye? On ethical grounds. Because women are, are more ethical than men? Okay. Are women naturally more moral than men? That's what you're saying, correct? <coughs> we're, back to, we're back to all men are bastards. <laughs> Okay, if she's more ethical, then he's wrong to go to the woman because he wants to succeed. He should go to the guy who's more susceptible. He should go to the guy who's more easily swayed. You know, there was a study done by, by, by Dr. David Buss at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm sure you're not surprised at this, but it's actually happened several times. He sent a very attractive woman to approach 100 men on the street randomly. She was in her 20s and she said, you know what, I'm here, I'm alone, I'm lonely, I, I'd like to spend the night with you. Totally random. How many men, married and single, accepted a proposal? Out of 100? 100. 95. Now, then they sent a man to approach random women, married and unmarried, and say, I'd like to spend the night with you. How many said yes? One. Okay, so, and that was an actual study. So based on that, the, the, the serpent is making a huge mistake. He should be going to the guy. Men are a joke. You can seduce them like that. Their morality disappears in a second. Their fidelity disappears in a second. Why does he understand, this serpent, that the woman is the insatiable one? What did he see in her? In other words, in other words, whether it's materially, sexually, we always think that it's the men who are insatiable, correct? Think about it. How does it work these days? The husband says to his wife, honey, I'd love to have some sex tonight. And she responds, not tonight, honey, because I have a headache. And yet the man can have an axe lodged in his head. <laughs> and he's still ready. <laughs> Honey, you sure you want to do this? I don't know how to I don't know how to tell you this, but you've got a axe <laughs> in your head. And his response? So what? You ready? Your girlfriend wanna come over too? Why does he go to the woman? Do you want to imply women are yes. more materialistic? Sorry? More materialistic? Women are more materialistic? I'm asking you whether you want to imply that. I'm not implying anything. I'm trying to get some feedback before I give you my little read on this. If can break her down. Let me, let me, so that, by the way, please understand. I, got, I just got off a plane. I have not slept. And I want to be methodical. So I want to just, for a second, before you answer, I want to trace what we've done so far. Very simple. Number one, we've said, that the Jews have to impact the world universally with their values. Number two, the Western world is in need of new values because it's collapsing due to an erosion of its values. Number three, I said in the first lecture we're gonna deal with growing materialism, commercialization of Christmas and Hanukkah and how objects give people joy, how love uh, is substituted today by giving people gifts. Not the gift of yourself, but some dumb piece of plastic that you're gonna sell on eBay next week. Number four, we said, that once upon a time, people were content to be made to feel special 
by someone placing them at the center of their existence. If someone chose you, you were the planet around which this guy's life revolved. He basked in your light. He needed you, and because of that, you felt you were extraordinary rather than ordinary. You don't have to have 10,000 fans like most celebrities think today in order to be special. You need one person, and that's the idea of love. But then I, went, I traced it back to Adam and Eve, and I showed they had that. They had that. It's what we all say we want today. It's what every Hollywood movie is about, but it doesn't work in reality. Because in the first story of Adam and Eve, they're content to have each other. They're in paradise with no possessions until the serpent destroys it all by getting Eve to focus on what she lacks instead of what she possesses. He injects insatiability into her system. And now we're at a question. Why does he approach her? The man was the safe bet. Why the woman? It's Jesus. Powers. Come on, guys. You've got to think a little bit. It's the women today who are miserable, I said, right? One out of three women is on an antidepressant. Seventy-five percent of all divorces initiated by women. When you hear about the 50% divorce rate in the West, this has nothing to do with, with, with guys. The men don't want to be divorced. Why would they want to be divorced? Their wives cook for them and clean for them and give them kids and sex on tap. And, every, and during sex, studies show that for every eight sexual acts in marriage, the wife climaxes once and he does almost every other time. It's a great deal for him. It's a terrible deal for her. It's, and yet 75% of women are leaving these marriages because they're not happy. What does the serpent see in Eve to see that she's not happy? Because the, ser the serpent's role is for deceiving trickery. And, so, and the serpent knows that the most important thing for the woman is to be chosen. And so the serpent deceives the woman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She wants multiple choice. <laughs> Any woman in this audience, if you were in touch with your femininity, would be able to answer this question. I'm asking you, you are Eve. Stop pretending that women today are actually happy and satisfied. They're not, and why not? What's never good enough? <clears throat> to be a woman? Well, first of all, what does it mean to be a woman in society today? That is true. You are never enough. You're never, your legs are never long enough. Your chest is never large enough. Your hair is never blonde enough. Your eyes are never blue enough. And one thing is certain, you are never thin enough. And you are absolutely never young enough. In fact, I have women that come to me for counseling, and it's remarkable. Because they've just met me, they come with their husbands, and she'll say, I have a problem with sexuality, I was molested by my own uncle, don't let my husband touch me, and it led to a promiscuous period in my life, and then I slept with 30 men, and she'll start telling me every detail, and, and we barely said hello. Then I'll say to her, how old are you? How dare you? <laughs> the chutzpah! <laughs> How many of you guys sleep with again? I'm not sure if it's 41 or 43. And how old are you? I'm leaving now. <laughs> a birthday is a source of depression for a woman. You know, it's interesting. We've actually made, for women, the two most natural processes in the world. We've made them a sin. What are the two most natural processes in the world? Aging and eating. And every time a woman does either of them, she feels guilty. <laughs> I swear, you only thought I was eating. It looked like it was a tiny cube of cheese, I promise. My gosh, we've even gotten women to stick needles into their foreheads these days to erase the effects of aging. So what does Eve feel? If she feels like she's never good enough, why is she susceptible? What's happening? And the answer, of course, is simple. Why does the serpent see that Eve is susceptible? Why does he go to her? Maybe it's easier to break a woman. But why? Remember I said before that we're going to search for values that have no hyphen? They're not 
Christian values, the Judeo, the not Judeo-Christian values, the Jewish values? What? Exactly. But why? That is absolutely right. He sees that she's not fulfilled. But why? That is absolutely right. He would not have walked over to her unless he saw an opening, correct? She would have just ignored him. She enters into conversation because something's bothering her. What is it? Why isn't she fulfilled? Children fulfill us? Really? How many women abandon their family, especially these days, for an affair with a guy when they know that they're going to sacrifice everything. What's the most written, what, what is the most written about subject in the history of world literature? What is it? It's the adulterous wife. Lady Chatterley, Madame Bovary, Anna Karenina, Tess, name one happily married woman in world, in, in world literature. Whenever I ask that, you know what people tell me? Lady Macbeth. <laughs> World literature is about the dissatisfied wife. She is not fulfilled. Why? She's not fulfilled. Because she was made to second, so she's second. She feels second best. Does she? She wasn't chosen. Perhaps. It's a good answer. She wasn't chosen by Adam. She wasn't chosen by Adam. In other words? They have no choice. She's the only other man, so there's no other man to choose. Eve is the is the only wife in history who does not experience the uniqueness of chosenness. Adam does not choose her. He is, she is given to him. So she's not sure that she was chosen based on any kind of special attributes. And now she speaks to this serpent and the serpent makes her feel that she's desirable. In other words, Adam is two dimensional. What is the one thing we know about Adam? He's never suffered. He didn't have a father that neglected him. He didn't have a mother that pampered him. He didn't have parents who divorced. He had no mother-in-law who rejected him. He never had a job he was fired from. The Garden of Eden never challenged him. And that also meant he had no complexity. He had no depth. He could not need his wife. He could not choose his wife. He could only love his wife. So she questions herself because nothing makes her feel special. And the, the serpent sees that and he says to her, you really want to feel special? Then you have to do these things that are never allowed. The sinful is what creates excitement. I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. The first rule of desire is something forbidden and something sinful. Think about it. Imagine you all go to a beach. And, and if, okay, this is for the guys now. It's like gray outside, horrible weather. But you're in Florida, where I grew up, Miami Beach. You walk out on the beach and you see hundreds of women in bikinis. Guys, is that sexy? Okay, you guys are really coming with us now, okay. <laughs> Is it sexy? Yeah, it's sexy. Is it erotic? Of course it's not erotic, I'll prove it. What do men do at a beach? What do most men do at a beach? They either fall asleep, or they throw a frisbee. How erotic can it be? It's so erotic, look at all those. Okay, now, you're walking home from the beach, and you're walking past a woman's apartment, and she left the blinds to her apartment open. And there's only one woman now, and she's walking around showing the same amount of flesh, wearing the same amount of clothing, only this time it's an undergarment, it's not a bikini. Gentlemen, is it sexy? It's sexy. Is it erotic? 
Is your first thought as you walk home and you see that a woman has accidentally left the blinds open to her bedroom, is your first thought, gosh, I wish I had a Frisbee. <laughs> Where's the Frisbee? <laughs> you sit there going, there's a peeping Tom, but oh my God, look at that woman. <laughs> Suddenly you're over, you fall into a deep, irreversible coma. Why is the second scenario more exciting than the first? Come on, help me. Because in the first scenario, no matter how much flesh you see, you're designed to see it. They dress for the occasion. But in the second scenario, you're seeing something you're not supposed to see. Insatiability comes from a belief that the ordinary can never be made extraordinary. The everyday can never be unique. The natural can never be miraculous. You need to do something forbidden. And that's where Eve gets addicted to the insatiability. You know why women today are so unhappy in their relationships and why they're becoming more and more materialistic? Because their core emotional needs are not being satisfied. You see, Kabbalah says something very interesting. In Jewish mysticism, there are two heavenly energies. There is what we call soviv kalamin. That means God's infinite light and it's described as a circle. And from that light, God creates the world. It's like the womb. It has no beginning, no end. That's the feminine light. That's what we call the Shekhinah. Then there's the part of God that is not the God of creation. He's the God of history. And that's described as like a linear line, a God that attunes his light, measures it perfectly to the world. And that's a line. OK. There's this feminine side of God and the masculine side of God. Now. You'll notice, therefore, that a line and a circle are what comprise the basic stuff of all of creation. For example, the number 10 shows completion, a line and a circle. Computers work with units of digits opposites, lines and circles. Everything in the world divides into the masculine and feminine. Men are very goal-oriented. They have a very linear approach to the world. Women love that. Women love a man with a plan. But a woman has a much more cyclical nature, and she looks for the deep enrichment that comes specifically through emotional fulfillment. But let's say it's lacking. How often do we see women who are on these bad, these bad marriages with a husband who makes a lot of money, neglects them, and there is a unspoken bargain where she gets neglected, but she gets to spend whatever she wants. Instead of a heart of flesh, she gets a credit card of plastic. Insatiability results from broken relationships. It comes from being emotionally unfulfilled. The absence of love leads to a plethora of cash. When someone makes you feel emotionally chosen, you never become materialistically insatiable. The essence of the decline of the Western world and how we collapse this economy. The United States collapsed an economy in 2008 of $10 trillion a year. Because no matter what we had, it wasn't enough. Our cars were never new enough. Our, our, our homes were never large enough. And we created this subprime mortgage meltdown because size became everything. We started thinking with our reptilian brain where size does matter. Two minutes. Okay. In other words, capitalism is the engine of economic prosperity, but not soulless capitalism. We did a whole Oprah TV show just about this. The idea of soulless capitalism. It's capitalism where money is no longer a means to an end. It's an end in and of itself. It's where you pursue money for the purpose of accumulation. Because money has become the currency by which you purchase self-esteem. That's the mistake. And it comes from a dearth, from an absence of love and strength of relationships. That's why the essence of Judaism is that you always use money in order to build a relationship. How do I sum this up as a Jewish value? It's simple. You'll notice something very interesting. 
There are only two components to the world. There's time and space, as Einstein said. In Christianity, we use, we use time to acquire space. The essence of Christianity and Islam are the building of these giant empires. So in Christianity, you spend a hundred years building a giant cathedral and all of, of the community's resources. In Islam, within 60 years of the death of the Prophet, the, the caliphate extended through Iraq all the way to the Iberian Peninsula. Time is used to acquire space. God is glorified through property. God is glorified through acquisition. That's why all of the Christian kings, you see it today here in England. The queen is the defender of the faith and her opulence is what's most on display. Because time acquires space. And if you're the queen, you have palaces all over the place. And if you go to the Vatican, the same is true. I, ha I had the pleasure of having an audience with Pope Benedict XVI last May. And I, we got private tours of the Vatican. And the opulence is incredible. Because time acquires space. Time acquires property. What is the essence of Judaism? It's the exact opposite. We use our property to buy special moments with family. The Jewish law says that on Thursday and Friday you're supposed to take the money that you earn throughout the week and you're supposed to buy beautiful things for the Sabbath. You're supposed to have guests on Shabbos. We spend money on precious moments. We fly our kids in for the holidays, for the Yom Tovim. There are no great cathedrals in Judaism. Property has never been important. Our whole empire is this big. It's a tiny little sliver of country. And they won't let us 